Welcome to the Law Society of British Columbia's Rule of Law Lecture. I'm Jeff Campbell. I'm a bencher from uh, Vancouver County, and I'm chair this year of the Law Society's Rule of Law and Lawyer Independence Committee. The mandate of the committee includes monitoring issues that impact the rule of law and the independence of the bar. Uh, the committee is responsible for advising the benchers and also for promoting and preserving the rule of law through advocacy um, and public education. In recent years, the committee has been active in things like making submissions to the government uh, or issuing public commentaries about uh, issues such as judicial independence, prosecutorial independence, solicitor client privilege. We also hold what has become an annual lecture on the rule of law. The subject of the lecture this year is the rule of law, technology, and privacy. The permeation of technology into our personal space raises profound issues of privacy. Technology companies aspire for their devices to become our constant companions, um, absorbing our personal information and building unabridged catalogs of our thoughts and actions. They've created a world in which we are constantly watched, distracted, and targeted in covert ways. This raises concerns for some of us about privacy, free will, and our democratic institutions. The program this evening is focused on these challenging issues. We thank you for attending. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Tonight, our moderator will be Jennifer Chow, QC. Ms. Chow is uh, counsel at the Department of Justice, focusing on constitutional uh, indigenous and other litigation. She was appointed Queen Counsel in 19, or sorry, 2016. Uh, she is a bencher and she is a current member of the Rule of Law Committee. Jennifer. Thank you, Jeff. And I have the pleasure and honor of welcoming all of you tonight to our wonderful lecture. As uh, Jeff has mentioned, this is a part of our regular series, and it's just great to see such a great audience for tonight's event. Um, I also have the honor of doing the introductions. So I will start with the Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin. The Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin is a legal icon. In 1985, she became the first woman justice in the BC Court of Appeal. In 1988, she became the first female Chief Justice of the BC Supreme Court. In 2000, after sitting on the Supreme Court of Canada for one year, she became the 17th Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada and the first female Chief Justice to preside over a Commonwealth nation's Supreme Court. She made history again as the longest serving Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. Under her watch, the Supreme Court of Canada became a champion of Indigenous rights. Her legacy includes precedents that have addressed many of the most urgent legal and social questions of our time, including clarifying and expanding Indigenous rights, legalizing assisted dying, and protecting individuals' rights and freedoms. Although she retired in December of 2017, Chief Justice McLaughlin created a legacy that continues to be a powerful force in shaping the rights of all Canadians today. We are honored to have her presence here. And uh, I should just say that she's keeping herself very busy. And perhaps next year there might be a book club meeting. But uh, this is her most recent novel, Full Disclosure. And uh, apparently she will be signing autographs tonight. And there's a second. <laughs> And I'm told that there is a second book coming out shortly. I also have the honor and the pleasure of introducing Richard Peck QC. Richard Peck QC is the founding partner of Peck and Company. He has practiced law for over four decades and is widely regarded as one of the leading criminal lawyers in Canada. He is known for taking on difficult cases for marginalized clients and has appeared as counsel at all levels of court in Canada, including the Supreme Court of Canada. In addition to maintaining his legal practice, he has generously donated his time to various volunteer positions, including being a bencher, 
with the Law Society of BC, Chair of the CBA National Criminal Justice Section, and Governor of the Law Foundation of British Columbia. For more than 40 years, Mr. Peck has upheld the highest standards of integrity, professionalism, and community service, making enormous contributions to legal education, advocacy, and the administration of justice. His advocacy has shaped the development of substantive criminal law and charter jurisprudence in Canada. We thank him for taking time out of his busy practice to be here today. Now, before I start, I'll just give you a quick, uh, before, I'm sorry, the panelist starts, just give you a quick roadmap. Uh, we're going to hear from the Chief Justice for about 20 minutes. After that, we'll be hearing from Mr. Peck. After that, there will be about 10 to 20 minutes for questions and answers, and I encourage all of you to think of some pithy questions, otherwise I may have to pick on some of you. Thank you. Chief? Thank you for that lovely introduction. It was a bit misleading. My real role here tonight is uh, to warm you up for Rick Peck's <laughs> substantive talk. So I'm going to um, speak fairly generally about the rule of law, but I will touch on its impact on some of the problems with technology that we're facing today and the very serious uh, challenge we face of applying the rule of law to those problems. In the past weeks, the world has watched on its screens what is probably the biggest demonstration for a cause that's ever taken place in history. The million plus people who turned out were not demonstrating for peace or an end to persecution or recognition of a particular group right, or against pollution of our oceans and air, although their cause was related to all of these. They were demonstrating for a cause that seldom attracts much attention, the rule of law. I refer, of course, to the mass demonstrations in Hong Kong against a law that would allow individuals to be extradited to mainland China. I make no comment, uh, obviously, on the substance of the issue. I am a judge of the Hong Kong Final Court of Appeal, and I may get to rule on it uh, in due course. But I refer to the demonstrations only to note how unusual they were, and I think they continue. It is not often that one sees people demonstrating on legal issues or in support of the rule of law. We in Canada enjoy the rule of law, so much so that we take it for granted. We're not alone in that. Everywhere in the world, people seem to take the rule of law for granted. Even when it slips away, as has happened in Russia and other Eastern European countries that started off a few decades ago with promising democracies, the slide away from the rule of law is so subtle that few turn out to protest the decline. We should not take the rule of law for granted, nor should we despair because legal solutions and regulation seem sometimes slow. What we need to do is improve the law so that it can cope with the challenges we are now facing, including those of technology. The rule of law and independent, impartial, effective justice are the fundamental preconditions of personal flourishing, economic activity, and a stable, prosperous society. And the rule of law is vital to maintaining democratic governance. We need the rule of law, but central as it is to our existence, we're beginning to understand that it can be weakened and lost. Western democracies like Canada and the United States possess strong institutions and strong traditions of support for the rule of law. In the 75 years since World War II, the end of World War II, the rule of law has served as a bulwark against chaos and tyranny, and it's become deeply entrenched, so deeply that people like me thought it would never change. Yet even in these Western democracies, we see slippage as the independence of the justice system is undermined and people seek quicker, cruder solutions to their perceived problems. Even in Canada, we're not immune to the drift. I don't want to exaggerate, 
But perhaps it's easier now than it once was to invoke the notwithstanding clause to prevent the courts from upholding charter rights, to cut legal aid that is essential to court determinations, to cut court budgets to the point that courts can't do the basic job of deciding disputes between citizens in a practical and efficient manner. Who needs fair process? Who needs the law? We risk entering a vicious downward spiral. Denied what they need to do justice and uphold the rule of law, our judicial institutions risk faltering. Public confidence in the system risks sliding in uh, the rule of law. And it becomes easier and easier to say, we don't really need lawyers, we don't need court proceedings, we can fix things up other ways. But I believe the truth is that maintaining the rule of law is important, and it requires constant vigilance. But by whom? Who must be among the vigilant? The first group are the people I'm talking to here, the bar, and I know you don't need a lecture, but I can't help but stress the importance of the bar to maintaining the rule of law, an independent, strong bar. Lawyers are sworn to uphold the rule of law and the law, and so they must. It is not enough to earn a good living from the practice of law. The same traditions that give lawyers the exclusive right to practice law demand they uphold the foundations of the system in which they practice. And you know, no one can do this as effectively as lawyers. Judges are limited in what they can say about issues affecting the rule of law. Only the bar can tell the public when particular actions undermine the rule of law. A few years ago, when I found myself attacked, I personally experienced the importance of lawyers speaking up to counter allegations that otherwise would have undermined confidence in the Supreme Court and the judicial system. A strong and independent bar alone, however, isn't enough to maintain the rule of law. We also need a strong and independent judiciary. Judges must be vigilant to ensure that the judiciary remains, remains strong, independent, and effective. Like the rule of law, we tend to take independent and impartial courts for granted, yet we should not. We have seen overt attempts to undermine the independence of judges in many countries, such as the Hungary and Poland. We have also witnessed more subtle attacks on independence of judges. Just don't enforce the judge's order. Soon the court becomes irrelevant. Imprison a judge, as they have done in Turkey, who seems to be unsympathetic to your particular cause. The techniques of undermining an independent judiciary are well known. Court orders are left in force, reducing judges to impotence. Judges are imprisoned on dubious charges, or the judicial system is slowly politicized. The United States possesses a strong and independent justice system, yet it is worrying to see the trend to appointing judges on the basis of their political views and to witness growing public expectations south of the border that judges will vote the party line on critical issues. This has the potential to erode the actual and perceived independence and impartiality of the courts and to transform independent judges into a third level of political actors. Instead of an independent judiciary, the risk is a judiciary inclined to one political view or another. Instead of impartial judging on the basis of the law, the risk is partisan decision making dressed up in legal guard, garb. Well, we've been fortunate in Canada to be spared the politicization of the judiciary. No one can point to this or that justice of the Supreme Court of Canada or any other court and say that person is a liberal judge or a conservative judge. We prize a traditional tradition of appointments based on legal qualifications, not political leanings. But we do face challenges. To the extent that the courts are deprived of the necessary resources to operate effectively, they are crippled in their task of upholding the rule of law. To the extent people are denied counsel uh, or deterred from seeking of justice because they lack the necessary funds to hire a lawyer, we hamper the ability of the courts to do justice. We need to ensure that our courts have the necessary resources to do the job, their job, of upholding the rule of law. 
We need to ensure that a person whose rights are violated can come to court with the legal assistance she needs to present her case effectively. I come from Ontario where this is currently a very sensitive issue. If we do not do these things, the rule of law will slowly decline. I've been talking of where we are now, the status quo, but let me get to the heart of what we want to talk about tonight, the future and the changes that are presently upon us and will only continue into the future. These changes are amazing. Our society is transforming itself at an exponential rate and the changes are happening so quickly that we've been unable to harness the rule of law to deal with the negative sides of them. And this is a huge challenge, I believe, for the rule of law. Traditionally, the law has been harnessed. People have harnessed the law, politicians, citizens. When they face a problem, they've harnessed the law to deal with it. The gap between the wealthy and the disadvantaged of the late 19th century, the age of railroad barons, threatened to undermine American democracy and Canadian with it. And what happened? Laws were passed. Laws that forbade illicit co uh, combines, co co competence laws. Other examples abound. When consumers suffered from mass-produced products, which started to happen in the early part of the 20th century, tort law wasn't ready to deal with them. So we had some imaginative judges in Donahue and Stevenson who changed so that we could deal with the wrongs and harms that came from mass-produced torts, like snails in ginger bottles. Because before that, if you didn't know, if a defendant didn't actually know the plaintiff, he could say, I don't have any responsibility. So the law was very ill-suited to deal with the advent of mass manufacturing and automobiles which flooded the roads where people kept harming each other who'd never knew each other and never seen each other. But we found a way, a hundred years ago, a little less, to bring the law to bear on these new innovations. So the question will be, the question for you and for us in this room is, can we bring the law to bear on the innovations of the 21st century? In the past, whenever society threw up a new problem, economic development threw up a new problem, the response was, we'll pass a law, we'll change the common law, we'll fix it, we'll provide solutions so that people who are harmed by the new innovations will have legal redress. And that is the strength of our system. But now as we approach the second quarter of the 21st century, we are less and less engaging the law to deal with social change and the resultant damage it is calling. Think of the big changes in society and the negative fallout they are producing to individuals and ask yourself, is the law effectively being used to deal with these problems? Think of the impact of social media on privacy and reputation. In the past, the law has always protected privacy and reputation. It has targeted false and defamatory statements and held their makers to account. It has curbed pornography and hate speech. In the age of the internet, however, these protections don't seem to be working so well. People's privacy and reputations are invaded, it seems, and trashed, in many cases, with impunity. Enforcement agencies struggle to contain harmful speech under the old laws, but falls short. We are told there's nothing that can be done about these harms. Facebook, Google, these people are simply too big to take on, and the technology is too complex. We're told that this is simply the price of being linked in to social media and enjoying the new benefits that these new inventions bring. I really can't say whether that's true or not. 
I do know that the no law by many people is no longer seen as the primary way to protect people against these abuses. And if that's true, that doesn't ogre well for the rule of law. Think about data manipulation and interference with elections and other democratic processes. A decade or so ago, it was unimaginable that foreign states could interfere with elections in the United States, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, and other places. We relied on the sanctity of our elections as the basis of our democracy, and now we find that that is being attacked and undermined. How do we hold these states to account? When foreign states mine data and use it to undermine our democratic processes, how does the law hold them to account? Think automation and artificial intelligence. When automated cars decide to strike this pedestrian rather than another, who is responsible and on what principles? When artificial intelligence, based on digitized experience, develop new algorithms and morph into new uh, operating procedures without human interference, who is responsible if these new procedures injure people? It, the person who created the first algorithm, set up the system, will say, I'm not responsible. It wasn't foreseeable that the robot or the machine would do this. And then, who is responsible? Will our law find ways to deal with this? Or will it change in ways that present efficient regulation of these problems? Will we have another Donahue and Stevenson revolution? I don't know, but I sincerely hope so. Think of the big problems that face the world, the problems of climate change, mass migrations, and the growing, once again, gap between the rich and the poor. Where are the legal efforts to come to grips with these problems? Someone recently remarked to me, oh, forget about competition law. It's pretty much a thing of the past. And yet we're reliving the very same thing, that the gap between the rich and the poor in our time that caused competition laws to be brought in over 100 years ago. In the past, generation after generation has used the law to deal with the big problems they faced. Now the problems seem so big, so complex, so global, so fast moving, that solving them seems beyond the law's reach. Or at least that's what some people suggest. I, for one, am not convinced. I believe that with imagination, will, and determination, it should not be beyond human capability to devise legal solutions for the problems of the 21st century. But let me return to the rule of law. My fear is that if we do not find creative and effective solutions for the negative impacts of modern technology, injustice will increase, people will lose their faith in the law, and the rule of law may be weakened. It is less fashionable than it once was in many parts of the world to talk about the rule of law and attendant goods it has delivered to the world in the 75 years since the end of World War II. Human rights, protection for minorities, the effective remedies for real wrongs. Yet I believe it is important to do so. Indeed, I can see no alternative. There's no other mechanism out there that exists to protect rights and guarantee just outcomes, not only for the powerful and the privileged, but for everyone. In the end, the only weapon, I think, against injustice that the world possesses is the rule of law. It has always been and ever will be thus. In an age of skepticism about the rule of law, I believe it is more important than ever to affirm it, keep it strong, and keep it growing to meet the challenges of the future. So let me encourage each of you and all of you to do what you can to uphold the rule of law. Don't take it for granted. Speak up for it. Educate kids and adults about the importance of the rule of law. Support an independent bar. Speak up for courts and other institutions whose independence must be maintained for the rule of law to survive. Work for legal solutions, above all, to the problems that face our communities, our country, and our world. In everything you do, seek to keep the rule of law strong, vigorous, and respected.
If we do these things, the rule of law will survive and the world of the future will be a better place than other, without it. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your evening and to share these thoughts with you. Seventy years ago, George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, went to the printers. Satirical in form, it is a grim and depressing tale set in a futuristic totalitarian state where truth is banished, love is punished, and privacy is not possible under the omnipresent eye of Big Brother. The story begins with the rebellious protagonist Winston Smith, returning to his flat after a numbing day of work in his cubicle at the Ministry of Truth. It reads, Behind Winston's back, the voice from the telescreen was still babbling away. The telescreen received and transmitted simultaneously. <clears throat> Any sound that Winston made above the level of a very low whisper would be picked up by it. Moreover, so long as he remained within the field of vision, he could be seen as well as heard. There was, of course, no way of knowing whether you were being watched at any given moment. How often or on what system the thought police plugged in on any individual wire was guesswork. It was even conceivable that they watched everybody all the time. We will come back to Winston toward the end. In 1949, when that book was published, Orwell's reference to a TV screen that could both listen and watch would have been seen as mere fantasy. Comparatively few households had a television set. Even in 1984, when televisions had become ubiquitous, few would put much stock in the idea that a TV could become a household spy. It's now 2019 and things have changed. In an article published in the Globe and Mail earlier this month, the author Zia Tong sets out a disturbing description of the ways in which technology is being used in the 21st century. Tong notes that in England today, there are 20 towns where Big Brother doesn't just watch over you, he barks out orders and literally tells you what to do. One such town is Middlesbrough, which has a network of 144 speaking cameras. Here's a sample of what one hears. To the lady in the brown dress, blonde hair, with the male in the black suit, could you please pick that cup up and put it in the bin? In North London, similar cameras are installed at public housing developments. They're seen as oppressive when people standing outside their own homes are loudly told that they are loitering. In Romford, a town in East London, the Metropolitan Police recently tested controversial facial recognition cameras. Signs had been put up warning members of the public that automatic facial recognition cameras would film them from a police van. The Independent reports that a man named John saw the signs, pulled the top of his jumper up over his chin, put his head down, and walked past the cameras. Moments later, a group of police officers stopped him. They demanded to see his identification, became accusatory and aggressive. John, perhaps understandably, told them to go away uh, in a bit more profane language. <laughs> they responded by issuing a penalty notice, a 90-pound fine for an offense of public disorder. That's akin to our criminal code offense of causing a disturban disturbance by swearing in public. Tong notes, Britain, home of George Orwell, has more than 6 million CCTVs about one for every 10 persons. We move across the Atlantic. In San Francisco and a number of other American cities, public buses are equipped with sophisticated audio surveillance systems to listen in on the conversations of passengers. In Las Vegas, Detroit, and Chicago, 
There is what is described as the Intelli Streets system, installed in street lights and lampposts, with microphones and cameras capable of secretly recording pedestrians' conversations. Whether Intelli refers to intelligent or intelligence gathering remains to be seen. An even more pernicious use of technology involves so-called stalkerware apps. These apps use GPS to locate friends or wandering children. But they are also marketed towards jealous partners who want to monitor their spouse's whereabouts. As Elizabeth Renzetti, a journalist with the Globe and Mail, observed, while technology did not create stalkers, it certainly provides a newer, faster, stealthier pathway for them to travel. All of these devices come under the comforting heading of safety measures. In 2014, Edward Snowden revealed that Britain's government communications headquarters had been tapping into the home, into the home webcams of British citizens under a program called Optic Nerve. It was noted that some years prior, in 2008, more than 1.8 million Yahoo chat accounts were compromised as agents siphoned up millions of images through home laptop and desktop computer cameras. As Tong observes, while our fears tend to be directed to hackers spying through baby monitors or peeping toms peering through our windows, the biggest window into our private world stares right out at us every day the black pinhole of our webcams. Much of this may seem like an excellent application of modern technology to detect and suppress crime, until one recalls the cautionary words of President Franklin Roosevelt in 1941, quote, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. As a society, we have become habituated not only to intrusion, but also to an equally troublesome problem, self-divulgence. We regularly hand over personal information to non-state actors in the form of corporations such as Facebook, Google, and Apple, usually through what is enticingly known as the online experience. Jennifer Senior, a New York Times journalist, refers to this as the privacy paradox the contradiction between our contempt for companies that engage in surveillance of our lives versus the willing consignment of our personal information for the convenience of online services. These services are held out as being free of charge, but the old adage holds, nothing in this life is free. We simply pay with a different form of currency, our personal data. Surveys going back decades in this country show that Canadians place a high premium on personal privacy. So what do we ask is going on? It would seem that the apparently benign experience of being online numbs our alertness, numbs our alertness to the dangers the internet poses. We become lost in the experience as if mesmerized. Any sense that we are under surveillance is rendered figmental. Yet when the intrusive nature of what is happening is brought to light, we become momentarily indignant and then fall back into the same pattern. This cycle has a familiar ring to it, a compulsive pattern of behavior that is extremely difficult to break. In other words, we are addicts. We have also become slaves to convenience. We have now uh, in our homes the disembodied presence of something called Alexa. On verbal command, Alexa will turn on the lights, set the temperature, and start the coffee. This saves us the trouble of having to flip a couple of switches. <laughs> but at what cost? We forget that Alexa responds to our commands by listening. As we come to enjoy the ever increasing benefits of our technologically mediated lives, the digital devices we engage with not only reshape our ideas about privacy, but also influence our behaviors at a subliminal level. As Brett Frischman and Evan Selinger explain in Re-Engineering Humanity, quote, we begin to outsource responsibility for intimate, 
self-defining assessments and judgments to programmers and the companies that employ them. Already many people have learned to defer to algorithms when choosing which film to watch, which meal to cook, which news to follow, and even which person to date. Given that the design and workings of algorithms are almost always hidden away from us, it can be difficult, if not impossible, to know whether the choices being made on our behalf reflect our own best interests or those of corporations, governments, or other outside parties. As much as we want to believe that technology strengthens our control over our lives, in the words of Frischman and Selinger, the goal of designing programmable worlds goes hand in hand with engineering predictable and programmable people. In the digital age, our right to be left alone is silently depleting to a point of no return. As privacy recedes, so does autonomy, and autonomy is the essential building block of a liberal democracy. Pardon. In an essay on privacy written in 1980, Arthur Schaefer stated, the ideal of privacy is clearly one of the fundamental values of our culture. There is a close relation between the availability of a protected zone of privacy and the individual's ability freely to develop individuality and creativity. In a society which is frequently intolerant of or hostile to nonconformity, freedom from constant surveillance is an important precondition for the development of independent and critically minded individuals. The provenance of privacy is open to some debate, but let me give you what I think is a reasonable and brief history. In 1604, in England, we have Semaine's case. You'll all remember that case. That went to the issue of the sanctity of the home. The house of everyone is to him as his castle and fortress. We fast forward 150 odd years, Entick versus Carrington, 1765, recognizing privacy interests extend beyond the home to personal effects. 1849, Prince Albert versus Strange. The Solicitor General Romilly, one of the great law reformers of his day, referred to the principle that this court will protect every person in the free and innocent use of their own property and will prevent anyone from interfering with that use to the injury of the owner. A person has the right of property in the production of their mind and incident to that right is the right of making the same public. We cross the Atlantic again. 1888. A person named Judge Cooley in his second edition of Torts coins the phrase, the right to be left alone. Two years later, Brandeis and Warren in their famous uh, track, The Right to Privacy in the Harvard Law Review, adopted that phrase. 1928, now Brandeis is a judge, and albeit in dissent in the case of Olmsted, one of the first cases, by the way, under uh, prohibition, uh, described privacy as the right to be let alone, the most comprehensive of rights, and the right most valued by civilized men. 1967, the U.S. case, uh, Supreme Court case of U.S. versus Katz, finds that the right to privacy protects people, not places. Canada's Supreme Court follows suit, Justice Dixon, in his great writing in Hunter and Southam, 1984. Four years later, and we're, we see what we're doing is we're incrementally defining and expanding this notion of personal privacy, the protection of, the, of this zone of privacy that we so desperately need to develop as individuals. Justice Laferre and Diamond, quote, society has come to realize that privacy is at the heart of liberty in a modern state. Grounded in man's physical and moral autonomy, privacy is essential for the well-being of the individual. For this reason alone, it is worthy of constitutional protection, but it also has profound significance for the public order. The restraints imposed on government to pry into the lives of the citizen go to the essence of the democratic state. 
1990, same judge, Justice Laferre in Duarte. He echoes the language of the Solicitor General Romilly back in the case of Prince Albert versus Strange. He defines the right to privacy as the right of the individual to determine for himself when, how, and to what extent he will release personal information about himself. So there's a short history of privacy. And now uh, a brief look at the rule of law, and then I'll sum up and you can all ask Justice McLaughlin questions. If she... <laughs> the phrase, the rule of law, trips readily off our tongues. We commonly refer to it as a pillar of democracy. The adjectives we use to describe it include fundamental, foundational, indispensable. It's expressly referenced in our Constitution as a founding principle of democracy, of our country. It's explicit in the very oath we take when we're called to the bar in this province. Quote, uphold the rule of law and the rights and freedoms of all persons. That's the oath everyone in this room took upon being called. In 2005, our Supreme Court said, the rule of law is a fundamental postulate of our constitutional structure that lies at the root of our system of government. The late Tom Bingham devoted a whole book to the topic. Indeed, the phrase has been repeated so often, it has almost acquired the qualities of a faith in the sense of a belief in a divine truth. Hutchinson and Monaghan said in their book on the rule of law, it is the will of the wisp of constitutional history, which calls up the image of an elusive ball of fire dancing across the marshes, disappearing and reappearing. How do we capture the essence of this phrase? Bingham aptly identifies the core, what he calls the essential core, which we all know, all persons and authorities within the state, whether public or private, should be bound by and entitled to benefit of laws publicly made and publicly administered in the courts. Chief Justice Dixon added to this, quote, the law must stand supreme as the source and fabric of all social organization. That adds to our understanding, but I think there may be more. It's the kind of phrase, though, that is capable of individual interpretation and nuance. But I think we can get there. And I think Robert Bolt's great play, A Man for All Seasons, in the passage I'm about to read, gives that opening for us to look at it and decide what we think the rule of law is. Thomas More is talking to his son-in-law, Roper. Roper is incensed about some wrongdoing. He says he would set aside every law in, Eng in England to get at the devil. Moore's reply is apt and descriptive. And when the last law was down and the devil turned around on you, where would you hide, Roper? The laws all being flat. This country's planted thick with laws. Man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then. Yes, I'd give the devil benefit of law for my own safety's sake. The depth and meaning of those words was not lost on the great American jurist, Felix, uh, Felix Frankfurter, who had been a co-evil of, of Brandeis. He saw the play late in life in New York. When he heard that expression from Moore, he exclaimed, that's it, that's it. He immediately grasped that Moore's words went to the heart of our system of justice. He saw that the words expressed the need for the existence of law to ensure order and fairness in society. Dixon's words about fabric. He saw that the words expressed the necessity of everyone being equally subject to the law, but entitled to equal benefit of the law. And he saw that the words express that the laws are created by us. We decide. They're not imposed on us. They are the product of our will, our thinking, our creativity. If we accept the premise that privacy is an essential value 
worth protecting, we can't remain complacent. Privacy is one of the roots that leads to the rule of law. The fundamental problem, and the Chief Justice touched on this, is that the law has not kept pace with the development of technology in this country, or as far as I can see, any other country. One wonders if it even can, given the, as the Chief said, exponential increase in technology. This is actually not something that should surprise us when we stop and pause in our lives to think about what's going on. Decades ago, scholars and writers touched on this. They prophesied this state of affairs, but few were inclined to listen. And I suspect when we leave here, those of us who have these iPhones will look at their iPhones or what they're called and, and so on. And we'll quickly forget the, the lurking danger here. In his famous work, Discipline and Punish, Punish, Michel Foucault paints a picture of contemporary society that resembles George Orwell's 1984. He spoke of Bentham's Panopticon, a circular building designed with a tower at its center, surrounded by prison cells facing inward. The inmates stationed in the cells cannot see inside the tower, but the watchmen in the tower can always see inside the cells. The prisoners must assume they are always under observation and act accordingly, policing their own behavior. For Foucault, the panopticon operates as a metaphor for modern society. As surveillance creeps into ever more private aspects of our lives, in time, citizens too internalize the fear of being watched and as a consequence, begin to regulate themselves. He expressed it this way. He who is subjected to a field of visibility and who knows it assumes responsibility for the constraints of power. He makes them play spontaneously upon himself. He inscribes in himself the power relation in which he simultaneously plays both roles. He becomes the principal of his own subjection, his own subjugation. We've now come full circle, back to Winston, our protagonist. Winston's recalcitrance was detected and he was imprisoned and subjected to starvation and torture, both physical and psychological. The final paragraph of the novel sounds Orwell's cautionary bell. Quote, two gin-scented tears trickled down the sides of his nose, but it was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. We can only hope that that story remains fiction. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice, and thank you, Mr. Peck. This is the part now where uh, I am welcoming questions, and I'm going to kick it off by asking the audience some questions of my own. How many people have a social media account somewhere? Facebook, LinkedIn, dating sites. <laughs> and how many people text now instead of calling? What happened to the phone? I don't know. How many people cover the camera on their laptop computer? Because they're worried. All right, well, is there anyone here that's off the grid? <laughs> All right, how many of us admit to being addicted to our phones? Okay, so how many of us are worried about our privacy? All right, let's not all rush now, but there must be a microphone somewhere. I'm just going to look back. Is there? I'm going to ask those people who are worried about their privacy to grab a mic, or not quite grab, you know what I mean, and ask a question. Um, 
what should we be doing or advocating for in terms of changes to the law to keep up with the change of rate, um, or rate of change, I should say, in technology today? Uh, what about Facebook? We hear about Facebook in the news. They're collecting data on all of us. Um, are we worried? I'll read you some of the headlines. I just printed them off before I came tonight. Uh, technology is invading our privacy, has become a part of us. Your device probably knows more about you than your best friend. Every day, those of us who live in the digital world give little bits of ourselves away, and this is as Mr. Peck and Chief Justice alluded to in terms of, you know, are we in 1984? Um, have we just not noticed because we're so used to uh, sharing ourselves online? Um, in terms of concerns about s the state and government, I read uh, millions of smart cameras could soon police us based on our actions, emotions, clothing, and more. This is from an American site. The FBI has access to over 640 million photos of us through its facial recognition, recognition database. That's pretty scary. And what about the dawn of robot surveillance? I love that headline. But uh, all right, while you guys are thinking and good questions are percolating, I'll ask our panel to uh, address this question. Now that data collection from Facebook and online social media sites have uh, are known to collect personal information and we seemingly uh, still provide it. What should we do in terms of advocating uh, for a reasonable expectation of privacy on the internet? What can the rule of law do to protect us? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I wish I had the answer. Um, uh, clearly, uh, if my recollection serves one person, thinks the answer is nothing. I recall uh, vividly, and I know you'll probably say I, that I've, in my dotage, uh, misconstrued it, but I do recall many, many years ago watching TV while the question was put to Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. And his answer was, privacy, get over it. I was so shocked that it was impressed in my brain. So a year or two later, I was giving a speech, and I went and looked for it all over every site I could find. And I put it in the speech anyway, because I remembered it. And I had editors at the Supreme Court of Canada at that point, and they said, you can't say that. And I said, why not? They said, we can't back it up. It had been r removed. It, it had been removed from from the virtual world. And that scared me. Uh, privacy, get over it. In other words, his idea at that time, and whether he said it or not, is subject to debate now that it can't be backed up. <laughs> but think about it. That is one response to the question. I think it's a terrible response because it, it leads uh, in the hands of information in the hands of monopolies, information in the hands of the wrong people. It gets fed into the hands of the wrong people, we know that. Uh, and it can lead to a truly Orwellian uh, scene and uh, can be misused to basically deprive people of their power. So I think we have the rule of law. We need to really energize ourselves and, and and get down to business as a society, saying how can we pass laws uh, that will uh, rein this in? Uh, I don't. One problem I mentioned is 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 the concentration of information and power in one group's hands: Facebook, Google. Uh, and no one is bringing anti-competition laws to bear against them. There's no way to do that. Uh, the other is 
but basically just the lack of accountability, it seems to me. When, when they get the information, there should be some accountability, some rule structure that says you have to disclose how you're using it or to someone responsible. I don't know the mechanisms, but it seems to me that our only hope is to try to figure out how we are going to put this genie back in the bottle uh, so that we, we uh, can regulate it in a way that doesn't hurt people, that doesn't undermine our democracies, uh, that doesn't uh, lead to uh, social control uh, by uh, states that uh, may wish to control their citizens or infringe their religion or whatever. So I don't have any answers. I do think, though, that we should really focus on this and start holding our politicians accountable and saying we need answers on this. And I think lawyers have a leading role to play in this. I'm really glad we're having this session tonight because I think it's exactly the kind of thing we need to be discussing. And now Mr. Peck will give you the answer. <laughs> I concur. <laughs> I don't have any ready answers or great thoughts or even shallow thoughts but about this topic. But I think this, I think there's a component of education that is doable. And that is to educate our citizens, to educate maybe in the, starting in the schools about this whole issue, about the importance of privacy. Um, they do have these law classes in high schools. Uh, why couldn't they talk about some of these essential core values that most of us have come to accept, but we're watching dwindle away? So I think education may be a component of it. I agree with that. I think we should be having uh, conversations with this about little people in primary school and continuing it all the way through. What about laws to um, allow people to easily uh, apply to court or, or some other process to remove uh, things from the internet? Yeah, the right to be forgotten. And, and uh, this is being, has been tested. I think of all the places on, in the world where they're starting to look at these things, it's the European Union, and they've done some really good work. And uh, so uh, they have implemented this idea of the right to be forgotten, that you should be able to remove things uh, from, from the internet. And uh, I think it's, 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 it's one tool, it won't do everything, but it would certainly help some of the greater abuses. We see people whose, I've seen this in the courts, whose whole lives are ruined, young girls, who there's something on the internet about them, sometimes they commit suicide. And it's a tragedy. And, and, and there should be a quick and easy way of getting that removed so that uh, if, if Mr. Zuckerberg can remove his speech, I think we should be able to get other people <laughs> removing theirs. Mr. Peck? No, I have nothing to add to that. I mean, but I have a question, and I'm sure there are people in this room that will know or have a glimmer of the answer, is this even possible to ultimately remove data from this machine, whatever it is, this in the ether? I don't know. Has anybody got any comments on that? Well, I, th I think you can get people, the Europeans think you can get people to take it off certain sites, but to the question is whether it's buried somewhere else and whether people can get at it uh, some other way if they really apply a lot of ingenuity. Uh, probably uh, it's impossible to completely remove it. But, um, but I do think we could, uh, if you look at, if something bad goes up on, on, on Wikipedia in your biography, you should be able to get that out of Wikipedia at least. And it'll, it'll be somewhere floating around on clouds or wherever, but <laughs> you shouldn't have to look at it every time you look up your biography on Wikipedia. Do you think that the rule of law will ever catch up with technology or social media changes? I'm just thinking, for example, when we're talking about people concerned about their privacy, so someone comes along and they create something called Snapchat and something similar where 
someone sends you a photo and then you can look at it for about a minute or so and then it deletes itself. And then people get around that when they know it comes in, so they um, have their friends use their phone to record what's being sent. So even though it's um, deleted from Snapchat, it's someone else still has a copy. Are we ever going to, as, as Mr. Peck suggested, um, be able to wrestle yeah. this genie? Well, there'll always be copies around of everything, yeah. But maybe we can make some progress. I don't know. There'd be much, many more informed people in this audience on that subject, because I'm not particularly techy. But. Well, that's my cue to look over at the audience. I see a hand come up. If I can have uh, Miss Lynn, please uh, go down to the middle of the um, st steps and the person come out maybe to the side and grab the mic. Thank you. I don't have the technology experience to give you the answer to that, but I think it's a very interesting observation because I believe it's uh, the flip side of what you were saying about not being able to find Mr. Zuckerberg's comment. And it's something we're seeing quite a bit um, in the US now. If it weren't for the video replays of what Trump said one day and then he said something yeah. the other day, we would regret that, I think. Mm -hmm. I think that serves us. And so it seems to me that it's an excellent uh, connection to the rule of law which is, who should be able to arrange that? Well, somebody who can make a judgment whether it's history or invasion of privacy. Yeah, I think um, I'd like to, um, I think I could answer that better if I looked at the European law more closely. I don't think mm -hmm. it's just a demand, I want this off. There's a bit of a judicial proceeding and you have to show that it's false and so on and so forth. So I do think it's capable of regulation mm -hmm. in the same way. But you're quite right. I mean, uh, you you shouldn't be uh, able to erase history, which is a whole other subject uh, and, and a, fascinating, a fascinating one. And since I have the microphone, I'll just say one other thing. Uh, you've asked about, you know, what can be done. One of the things that I think is very insidious, and that is uh, Facebook or other organizations filtering what they tell us in response to what they've observed about us. So I think we all know that we're, uh, particularly during the last election in the U.S., there was filtering to prevent uh, or to s protect me or insulate me from ideas that didn't appear to be of my interest. So I didn't really want to hear a lot of Republican commentaries. I wanted to hear the Democratic stuff. Well, in an odd way, that's a helpful thing to me because if, if we take out the filters, then we'll be inundated with raw information. That's actually why Google is so helpful, is that it helps us find the things that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's imposing a huge cost on us as well to have that inanimate filtering of what might change our mind. Mm -hmm. So as something we might want to see changed, I think that's an area. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot written about silos and uh, people using the internet, uh, um, consulting only sources that confirm their own uh, views. And, uh, and that this is uh, a narrowing effect compared to the old days when you opened a newspaper and you were confronted with things that you might not have ordinarily bought into or turned to and so on. And uh, it has a reinforcing effect on society which tends to increase tribalism and, and the, the divisions between political uh, groups and factions. So it's, it's another spin-off uh, of, of the internet um, and uh, our new world. Mr. Peck? I think that... All right, we have another question to the left there. Thank you. <clears throat> really good conversation. Um, it's bringing ideas, but w the question I have is, how do we know who to trust? You know, we have uh, United States of America telling us to you know, um, <clears throat> deal with the Huawei uh, 
telephone company. Um, USA, they have Apple, they have Google, and all these American corporations. And so whose, um, whose interests are being served? Is it, is it about the rule of law? Or is there something bigger to that? And so how do we know who to trust? Uh, the other point I wanted to say was, can we trust technology? Can we use it for the, 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 the better good? When we go to court, should we, should we be destroying trees and, and you know, making books and books when we can use the technology to um, share court cases and rulings and all of those things? Uh, so uh, the 21st century, we should, be able to, we should be able to serve via email to opposing councils instead of using fax machines and things like that. You know, can we digitize our, our, our litigation system? And can that be trusted? Well, I, 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 it's, it's a difficult question, but there's several things there. But I think that, uh, yeah, it would, we, it's inevitable that if the justice system is going to continue to serve, it's going to have to use um, electronic uh, and digital um, tools. Uh, but, uh, I mean, there's lots of people smarter than I think that they can, they can devise systems to make sure data is safe so this is, uh, and that it will not be misused. So that is where we have to look. Um, there's a lot of malware around and people are working on technologies to improve it. But the key is if you've got confidential information in a court system, you've got to keep it safe. And, uh, and that's something you can, I believe, uh, do through technology. So uh, you trust your, 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 your institutions to do the right thing, and you trust them to get the right digital systems uh, in place, the right malware, et cetera, so that they uh, are reasonably confident that they're secure. Is there a 100% guarantee? Uh, never, I suppose. I've Brilliant hackers can, can sometimes move into anywhere, but there is a lot of, uh, a lot of data that people aren't getting to. We, we, there are many, many billion dollar enterprises who seem to be quite confident that nobody's gonna steal their secrets. They've got it figured out. So I think, I think it should be capable of the, being, uh, being uh, controlled in that sense. <clears throat> Mr. Pat? No. Okay. We have time for one or two more. I see some hands over there. We'll see whoever the mic goes to first. <laughs> uh, Would you just an stand observation. Up, Would you stand up, please? Just a quick observation. I share the concerns about Facebook and Google on, on, the, pri on the private side. But I also acknowledge or, or recognize we're going into an election period right now. Mm -hmm. You'd be amazed at how much information our political exactly. parties have on us. They have a lot of information. How exactly they get it, I don't know. But I'm concerned about the almighty power of the state yeah. marrying with the power of the private sector where they gather the information and it's those two powers together where I start to get concerned. And to just draw an analogy, there was a time when people hid behind freedom of contract principles and said that, oh, governments shouldn't be making laws to limit or to prescribe what employers have to pay their employees, for example. People hid behind the rule, you know, the freedom of contract doctrine. But eventually, over a long period of time, um, the courts ruled that, in fact, governments could limit and could prescribe and say that you had to, that these minimum wage laws and so on were appropriate. So the point being that we have the power, I think, in our current legal systems to, um, to say that these people that have the information must manage it in a way that um, uh, includes certain minimum protections in the same that we have, minimum, have uh, protections on payment and vacation and whatever in employment standards. So the idea that governments can't do anything I don't think would be wrong. I think we have that power. Final ob observation on the ed education side where I completely agree, and I do a lot of work in education law, public and private, 
and of course in high schools and even to some extent at the post-secondary level, what they'll say, oh, we don't have anybody to teach to that, uh, we don't have any time in our schedule, it's an elective, people can take it if they want. But in reality, a big uh, innovation in, educa in the education worldwide right now is what's called competency-based education. And you shouldn't be able to get a high school diploma or a degree unless you've met certain requirements. And so you don't need time in class, but you shouldn't be able to get your diploma until maybe you've read your lecture tonight <laughs> on, on privacy and the rule of law. Not anybody, in my opinion, no one should get a high school diploma until they have had some those sorts of things. And that's something easy that governments could do. Thank you. Great observations. Thank you. Great. We have time for one last question. I see some more hands up there. Uh, so we had Mr. Peck's uh, useful rundown of the history of privacy law, and I couldn't help but notice how focused it was on the individual all through time. Uh, and really, when we were looking at the data that's being collected in social media, like no one, no one cares about my Amazon purchases today. Uh, a magnet, knife block, uh, a mop bucket, who cares? No one cares. But what we do care about is what everyone purchased on Amazon today. So how can we change the focus of the legal analysis from the individual to this broader societal question of all of our data and what that says about all of us. So is privacy more a question of all of society now and kind of creating these behavioral futures that are being traded by these companies? That's yours. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take it you're talking about a notion of uh, proscribing uh, conduct that affects a group or an identifiable, identifiable group, an electorate, a collective of people? What is it exactly? I mean, I don't see, I think as long as you can define what it is you need to proscribe by law, you can do it, whether it's an individual or not. The individual focus is a natural evolution of uh, philosophy and history in, in the Western world in the context of today's understanding of privacy. I mean, you have uh, people like Schaefer who predicate his formulation of a protected zone based on Mill's uh, on liberty and Mill's emphasis on the autonomy, autonomy of the individual. Um, I don't think there's necessarily a separation of individual and collective rights where privacy is concerned if we're talking about these uh, entities, these corporations that are able to grab a whole bunch of uh, privacy uh, from a whole bunch of people is what I mean. I think the focus has to be on that entity and what they're doing with it. And that's where the focus of the law has to be. I don't know if that answers the question, but it, I'm trying. Well, I've, I'm noticing the time. And first, I want to say thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for people that pose questions and commentaries. And thank everyone for attending. Apparently there are gifts on behalf of the Law Society, which I will hand out. But before uh, we go, I'd just ask everyone to give our lovely speakers another wonderful round of applause.